We continue our study of Isaiah, Jehovah Saves. We'll have this lesson and one more lesson next week to complete our study of the 66 chapters of Isaiah. In the first 39 chapters, we see that Isaiah focused on the judgment of Judah and the other nations, the reasons for the judgment. But in the final 27 chapters, we see the, the good news that Isaiah has to uh, bring or brings for the nation, uh, for God's people, uh, in fact, uh, everywhere and through all time. We see that God is going to deliver Judah from the Babylonian captivity. But even more importantly, he's going to deliver all men from sin by sending his servant, the Messiah. He talked about his servant Cyrus uh, before he's even born and how he will allow the captives to return from Babylon. And more importantly, he talks about the Messiah who's going to be born of woman, uh, come and redeem man from sin. We've focused in preceding chapters uh, on God's special servant, his ideal servant, the Messiah, in the servant songs of chapter 42, 49, 50, and 53. This week and next week, we'll focus on what that means to God's people, uh, what, what the work of the Messiah accomplishes. In Isaiah chapter 54, God compares the experience of God's people to that of a, a woman in childbirth. While pain may be excruciating, it's temporary and it will be replaced with joy. In Isaiah 54 and verse 1, we read, Shout for joy, O barren one, you who have borne no child. Break forth in a joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed for the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. In verse 4, God reminds the people not to fear. Uh, even though perilous times are ahead of them, deliverance will follow. He says, fear not, for you will not be put to shame. And do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. For a brief moment, in verse 7, he says, I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. So the judgment was temporary, but God's compassion is eternal. This almost, uh, well, it does resemble the picture of a child that's been punished, asking the parent, do you still love me? And of course, parent loves the child. In fact, that's the reason they punish the child. If they didn't love the child, uh, they would have the child do whatever they want. But, but a loving parent has uh, better plans and a higher aspiration for their child and will offer correction. And so because of God's love, he does correct the people and his love continues long after uh, the correction. In verses 9 through 17, we read, For this is like the days of Noah to me, when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor I, will I rebuke you. The flood was a terrible punishment, but God's love continued, and he blessed Noah and the descendants of Noah. In verse 10, he says, For the mountains may be removed and the hills shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you. And my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord, who is compassion on you. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I set your stones in antimony, and your foundations I will lay in sapphires. Moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies and your gates of crystal, 
and your entire wall of precious stones. All your sons will be taught of the Lord, and the well-being of your sons will be great. In righteousness you will be established. You will be far from oppression, for you will not fear, and from terror for it will not come near you. If anyone fiercely assails you, it will not be from me. Whoever assails you will fail or fall because of you. Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work. And I have created the destroyer to ruin. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. God is going to vindicate his people. They will, they will be delivered. Uh, their enemies will be defeated. We see in, in chapter 55 that this is accomplished by God, not man. In fact, man cannot earn, attain, or purchase what God will provide. Isaiah says in verse 1, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. This seems puzzling at first. How can one purchase anything without money? But the answer is that God is the one who will supply. We see in chapter 55 and verse 3 that in fact uh, God is, is going to remember his promises to, to, to David. He says, incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown David. God hasn't forgotten his promises uh, to David to bring one of his descendants to his throne to reign forever in an eternal kingdom. Ezekiel will make these same points while the people are actually in captivity a century later. In Ezekiel chapter 34, Beginning in verse 21, Ezekiel says, Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from the land so that they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them and the places around my hill a blessing, and I will cause showers to come down in their season. They will be showers of blessing. Also, the tree of the field will yield its fruit, and the earth will yield its increase, and they will be secure on their land. They will know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bars of their yoke and have delivered them from the hand of those who have enslaved them. They will no longer be a prey to the nations, and the beasts will of uh, the earth will not devour them, but they will live securely, and no one will make them afraid. I will establish for them a renowned planting place, and they will not again be victims of famine in the land, and they will not endure the insults of the nations any more. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. They, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord. As for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, you are men, and I am your God, declares the Lord. Clearly, this passage looks at more than the return from Babylonian captivity. It looks at the Messiah, the, the Good Shepherd, the covenant of peace, the security, the safety uh, in God's kingdom, that uh, he protects us from all our enemies, that he gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness, that uh, even if our body is uh, killed, our soul is preserved and untouchable, uh, protected by God. And he, of course, emphasizes that he's not talking about literal sheep, but talking about men. In chapter Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 24 through 28, uh, again, the idea is expressed very similarly. It says, my servant David will be king over them and they will all have one shepherd and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. 
They will live on the land that I give to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived. They will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them and I will be their God and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Of course, Ezekiel is not talking about David being resurrected, but he's talking about the seed of David, the Messiah. And he's not talking about the physical land of Judah, but he's talking about uh, the, the kingdom, the nation that this Messiah will establish. And he talks about the covenant of peace. And he talks about making his sanctuary in their midst, not a physical temple, but a spiritual temple, uh, the temple that Paul describes in Ephesians, the second chapter, in which God is, makes his dwelling place uh, within his people. Turning back to Isaiah chapter 55, we see that Isaiah's message is that, uh, that they must or that this kingdom is going to include nations. It's going to be expanded. It won't just be uh, Judah or Israel. He says, behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he, was, he has glorified you. So the message from Isaiah in verse 6 is, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him, and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so he concludes this chapter in verses 10 and 11 by talking about how effective God's word will be, just as the rain and snow are able to bring forth uh, fruit from seed. So God's word will not return empty, but will accomplish what he desires. In chapter, in chapter 56, the prophet says that salvation is coming, that God's righteousness will be revealed, but this will necessitate necessitate a change of behavior on their part. They will need to obey God rather than disobey God and disregard him. In chapter 56 and verse 1 we read, Thus says the Lord, preserve justice and do righteousness. This hasn't happened uh, in Judah and was the reason for their judgment. But salvation is about to come. My righteousness is to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who takes hold of it who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing evil. We see again that Isaiah emphasized that the kingdom is going to be expanded. Those who have been excluded in the past, in verse 3, the foreigner and the eunuch uh, will no longer be excluded. We see in verses 6 and following that the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, Everyone who keeps from, from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even those who I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For the house, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares yet others I will gather to them to those already gathered. So again, we see this picture is much bigger than just the return of uh, Judah from Babylonian captivity. But it's talking about a, a new expanded kingdom that will manifest God's glory by uh, including all men. It's, as I, Isaiah had said all the way back in the second chapter, in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it will come about in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. 
It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We see in this passage that God's holy mountain is going to be established, his house, that all peoples will flow into it, Israel and others. And this house will be made up of people who obey rather than disregard God's teaching. But this is not the current situation <clears throat> with God's people a century before the judgment. We see instead uh, at the time that Isaiah writes this, that things are very different. In verse 9, all you beasts of the field, all you beasts in the forest, come to eat. His watchmen are blind. All of them know nothing. All of them are mute dogs, unable to bark, dreamers lying down who love to slumber. And the dogs are greedy. They are not satisfied. And they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each one to his unjust gain, to the last one. Come, they say, let us get wine and let us drink heavily on strong drink, and tomorrow will be like today, only more so. And so we see the, the disregard for God that's been happening uh, prior to Isaiah and even continuing through Isaiah's time that will lead to the captivity. But, but God points out in chapter 57 that, that this in chapter 58, Isaiah begins by emphasizing in verses 1 through 3 that in order for us to receive God's grace, we must first accept responsibility uh, for our actions that have separated, from, separated us from God. Uh, instead of blaming God for uh, the judgment, instead of blaming God for uh, our distance and separation, the break in our relationship, we need to recognize that the problem is not a problem with God, but it's a problem with us. It was a problem with the nation uh, of, of Judah, not with God, that brought about the Babylonian captivity. It's our uh, issue with sin that separates us from God, as he's going to say in the next chapter. But here in chapter 58, he says, Cry loudly, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression, and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me day by day, and delight to know my ways. As a nation that has done righteousness, and has not forsaken the ordinance of their God, they ask me for just decisions, they delight in the nearness of God. Why have ye fasted, and you do not see? Why have you humbled yourselves, and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Behold your fast for contention and strife, to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. They haven't come to God to be justified, but they come to God trying to justify themselves. They proclaim that they're a nation who's done righteousness when Isaiah has clearly cataloged their sins. They, they think that uh, because of their fasting and activities that, that they've chosen, that uh, they should be right with God. But they've offered sacrifices instead of obedience. What God has desired was obedience, and instead what they gave was transgression in verse 1 and sins. And so the point is that the break in their relationship with God is not because God has been unfaithful, but it's their sins and simply play acting and pretending to be righteous uh, is far different from the reality that God desires obedience rather than sacrifice. In verses four and five, we see that what they're willing to sacrifice is what God doesn't desire. And any time we sacrifice what God doesn't desire, it's useless and vain. Much like Saul in 1 Samuel 15, when instead of, obeying, instead of obeying God and destroying the Amalekites, he spared the king and the best of the flock so that 
uh, those could be sacrificed. And as a result, he disobeyed God and dishonored God rather than honoring him. In verses 6 through 7, we see the sacrifice that God desires. It is not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke, the things that Israel has chosen. Instead, he says, is it not to divide your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him, and to not hide yourself uh, from your own flesh? These, this language is very similar to Micah, one of Isaiah's contemporaries, when in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, he proclaims, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come with burnt offerings with the yearly calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams or in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And so here Isaiah talks about uh, the need to divide their, their bread with the hungry, to care for the homeless poor, to, to cover the naked, it's very similar to the language that Jesus uses in the Gospels, especially in Matthew, the 25th chapter, when in the day of judgment, he talks about those who cared for him and his needs uh, when they cared for the needs of others, as opposed to those who dishonored the Lord by neglecting the needs of others. This is a message that's consistent throughout the prophets. If they desire God's blessings in verse 8, they must seek God's pleasure rather than their own. They must offer what God has requested and required rather than substituting their own will. Instead of a little time at the temple, God wants their lives to be altered and changed to reflect Him. We read in 50, Isaiah 58 verse 8, Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth. And your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking of wickedness, if they will stop trying to blame God and instead accept their responsibility, if they will start obeying God and then God will pour forth his, his blessings. In chapter 59, we see in the first two verses really a summary of what has been said in chapter 58, and that is the need to accept responsibility for our actions and stop blaming God. God is not the problem. We are the problem. We read in Isaiah 59, verse 1, Behold, the Lord's, Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. Again, the problem is not with God, but the problem is with us. In verses 9 through 11, we see that all hope of salvation or righteousness will elude us until we stop trying to justify ourselves. Isaiah says, therefore, justice is far from us and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but behold darkness. For brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday as in the twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. And until we acknowledge our sin and turn to God and receive his blessings, uh, this will continue to be our condition. In verses 12 through 16, we see all efforts of man fail. Again, it's Jehovah that saves. Isaiah. 
Jehovah saves. We see that God must intervene in our behalf. In verse 12, we read, For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away, for truth has stumbled in the street and uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking, and he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Now the Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice, and he saw that there was no man, and he was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate, a helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. According to their deeds, so he will repay, wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. We see that God is going to send a redeemer. Uh, uh, he's going to send salvation by his own arm. He describes this redeemer in verse 20 when he says, A redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgressions in J Jacob, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. The Redeemer is going to bring a new covenant in verse 21. And this servant that's going to redeem us, God's spirit will reside on him and he'll have God's words in his mouth. He won't speak his own message, but he'll speak the, the message of his father, God the Almighty. In chapter 60, we see that God will bring light and glory. He'll bring prosperity. He'll provide safety and security, uh, not just by delivering Judah from Babylonian captivity, but by delivering man from sin. He says in verse 1, Arise. Shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Just as he could say to the nation of Israel before they crossed the Jordan River, I've given Jericho into your hand. Before they had ever marched around the walls or the walls fell down, he could proclaim it as an accomplished fact because he is God. And so he proclaims even before the Babylonian captivity, not only released from that captivity, but the release from sin that's going to be accomplished by the Redeemer. All this will be in the future, but all of it is as certain as God and God's word. Isaiah says in verse 2, For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar and your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and be radiant. Your heart will thrill and rejoice because of the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. Uh, God's people will be radiant. They will prosper. In verse 7, they will be Glorified, He says, all the flocks of Kedah will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaoth will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar, and I shall glorify my glorious house. In verse 9, he says, surely the coastlands will wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Glory. Radiance. This is what God has planned for his people. Not just deliverance from Babylonian captivity in verse 10, where foreigners will help with funding the building of the walls, kings 
the Persian kings will minister the, to their need. Uh, God will provide uh, favor and compassion for his people in their return. But God has a much grander deliverance in sight. He says in verses 15 and 16, whereas you have forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you an everlasting pride, a joy from generation to generation. You also suck the milk of the nations and suck the breast of kings. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your savior and your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. Again, he talks in verse 17 about their prosperity and in verse 18 about their security and safety. But in verses 19 through 21, we see that God is talking about more than a physical nation. He's talking about more than something that's going to be on this earth. But he's talking about the radiance of his uh, messianic kingdom, the kingdom that's going to be established by his son. He says, no longer will you have the sun for light by day, and for brightness will the moon give you light. But you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane. For you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. And the days of your mourning will be over. Then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. God's glory is going to be brought about by the Redeemer, the Messiah, and the establishment of the eternal kingdom. Uh, it's, it's interesting as we, we read the language that's used here. It's, it's impossible not to be reminded of the language that John uses in the last chapters of the book of Revelation. As he talks about there being no need for sun or moon, but God being the light, the the Messiah being being our light. And he talks about the radiance of God's people. He uses the, the imagery of uh, not only of the book of Revelation, but even the imagery of the, the garden back in Genesis, uh, the second chapter. And so from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, uh, the emphasis on the fact that God will save, God will glorify his people, and this is what's being emphasized in Isaiah chapter 60. God is the one who will bring glory. God is the one who will provide glory. What man is incapable of, God will provide. Next week, we'll conclude uh, the, our study of the book of Isaiah by looking at chapters 61 through 66, uh, seeing more of the description of what God has planned uh, for his people and the expression of his glory. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week.